Welcome again to Biblical Insights. Tonight we're talking about water supplies. Now, in this country where I want to drink water, I go to the faucet or I go to the refrigerator where there's a spout and I just put my glass under there, fill it up and have a drink of water. But in Bible times, particularly in Old Testament times, uh, it was different. And so I want to read from uh, Jeremiah, second chapter, beginning with verse 4, and it climaxes at verse 14 with a very important verse about water supplies. So listen and follow along as we read this verse. Verses. Verse 4. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, What injustice did your fathers find in me, that they went far from me, and walked after emptiness, and became empty? They didn't say, Where is the Lord who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, who led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and pits, through a land of drought and deep darkness, through a land where no one crossed and where no man dwelt. I brought you into the fruitful land to eat its fruit and its good things, but you came and defiled my land, and my inheritance you made an abomination. The priests didn't say, Where is the Lord? And those who handle the law didn't know me. The rulers also transgressed against me, and the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that did not profit. Therefore I will yet contend with you, declares the Lord, and with your sons will I contend. For cross the coastlands of Kittim and see, and send to Kedar and observe closely, and see if there has been such a thing as this. Has a nation changed gods when there were not gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which doesn't profit. Be appalled, O heavens, at this, and shudder, be very desolate, declares the Lord. Now here it is, verse 13. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, to hew for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. They've forsaken the living water and hewed for themselves cisterns. I remember in one of the last churches I pastored, I visited one of my parishioners in the hospital. Now he was battling terminal cancer and he was in a lot of pain, but something bothered him even more than the pain. And that was the fact that they wouldn't let him drink water. The best he could do was dip a sponge in a glass of water and wet his lips. Well, we take water for granted, as I said at the beginning, until it's gone. And that's what God is telling his people through Jeremiah the prophet. You've forsaken the real source and you've gone to other things. In the Bible, there were three sources for water. First of all, there were springs. These he called living water or moving water. They were, it was bubbling, it was clear. It was, the springs were fed by the rains, but they bubbled up pure and sweet. Uh, we see them in places like En Gedi and other places in the Bible. Secondly, there was wells. Now, wells were dug by men, like Abraham. Abraham dug a lot of wells. And they were supplied the same as the wells in our day. Our city water supplies are supplied by aquifers, pools of water underneath the earth that come up into the wells that are dug. Although they were replenished constantly, sometimes, and particularly in uh, Bible lands, which was essentially desert country, sometimes it would go dry. Finally, there were cisterns. 
Cisterns were dug out of the rock, and during the rainy season, they would catch the water, and they supplied the water during the dry months. If you go to the internet and do a search for pictures of cisterns in Bible time, you'll find a, a huge supply of pictures uh, of cisterns that still exist. Some, some covered hundreds of thousands of gallons when they Some were under buildings like uh, temples today, and you could go down below the building and see all this water that was stored up. Some were small. In fact, I told you, uh, in Jeremiah, we've been studying Jeremiah, and one of the later chapters, uh, they threw Jeremiah into a cistern, and there was no water there, but there was mud, and he sunk in the mud. And when they pulled him out, they had to wrap ropes under his arms and pull him out. So cisterns were uh, the worst kind of a source. Uh, sometimes they would crack in the rock, and they would drain themselves, and... Uh, So today we still have cisterns. I'll tell you about a couple in a minute here. I saw an ad on, on the internet last week where you could buy a 50-gallon rain barrel to catch the downspout water from your eaves troughs. That's a modern-day cistern. Uh, I remember when I was, I think, in the seventh grade, we moved to a small town in northeastern Indiana. And uh, as you leave town, you cross the river and turn right and go down a, a sand or gravel road uh, along the river. And you cross under a, a railroad bridge. And off to the right was a wooded area, or actually just kind of a wild area, uh, that they called Hobo Valley. Uh, they called this this, I suppose, because the trains went by and sometimes those trail, those uh, freeload riders would jump off and enjoy the valley. But in the middle of that valley was a spring. And many times I've ridden my bicycle out by there and I've stopped and walked over to that spring. And all around that spring there was these dead leaves and weeds and things. But in the middle of that, this spring would bubble up and it was crystal clear and cold and you could put your hands down and take a drink and it was so refreshing. This was living water. This was what God was talking to uh, his people about. You have given up the living water. So the Bible compares the life in Christ, the Christian life, the Spirit-filled life to living water. In the New Testament, the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verses 13 and 14, Jesus answered the woman at the well. Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone that drinketh of this water from the well will thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst but that water I shall give him shall become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. Living water. Now, you notice something about that? Well, I want to read another verse first. Uh, in John 7 again, verses 37 and 38. Now, on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, if any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, from within him shall flow rivers of living water. From within him. Now, if we have that life in the Spirit, we not only partake of the living water, we become a source of living water to other people. So the Christian is not only resourced, but becomes a source. I wonder how many Christians today really realize that that's part of our role as a Christian, is to become a source of living water for others. Do you ever notice 
how living water or moving water we're talking about has a cleansing effect. I remember when we lived in Colorado, I spent several days up in the mountains and in these springs of, of sparkling water that flowed down from the melting snow. You could pick up a handful of rocks and they were smooth. The water flowing constantly over those rocks would smooth them out and cleanse them. And once again, that water in those streams, you could just cup your hands and drink of it. It was pure and cold and clear. The point I think I want to make here is the fact that if we're enjoying a life of living water, our lives are changed by the living water. I remember some of the old saints in the church I grew up in and went to as a childhood. They were, they were different. They had been shaped by years and years of the living water in their lives. And, and I, I look back on them, they were such examples. They became a source that I looked up to and I patterned my life after. So God condemns his people in Jeremiah of two evils. The first, they forsook the source of living water. Oh, friends, let's never forget. Let's never forsake the living water, the spirit of Christ in our life that keeps us alive and makes us a source to others. The second evil, he not only left the living water, but they had built for themselves cisterns. The cisterns were their source of spiritual life, or their source, their source of life itself. Now, the trouble with cisterns, they can be broken, and they won't even hold water. So you could be, you could be fooled by thinking you have a secure source of water. How many times do we pursue something that we think is going to make our life complete to find out it's got a crack in it, it won't hold, it dries up? See, one of the problems of a cistern is it's sourced by runoff. So if we're trying to live our lives out of the cisterns of the world around us, we're trying to live off the overflow of other people. And it just don't work that way. Cisterns become stagnant. I remember we were talking about cisterns when Jan and I were able to visit Israel in 1993. We went to the uh, uh, to the tomb at Calvary. And at that site at Calvary is a cistern. Now, we didn't go down into the cistern, but we looked at the diagram. It's so big and so deep, there's a ladder that goes all the way from the top down to the bottom. But you know what? It was dry. It didn't last. So cisterns become dry, first of all, but they also become stagnant. They also have a tendency to collect junk. Leaves and twigs and insects. When, uh, before I went to school, my grandfather was a pastor and we lived in a, a rented parsonage in, in a small town in Indiana. And out beside the house, was a barrel that had been sunk in, there, in the ground. It was a cistern. It was there to catch water. I'm not sure they drank it, but they used it for other things. But uh, it was full of leaves. And I remember one of the things we used it for is my grandfather used to kill snakes and he'd throw those dead snakes down into the cistern. It was a place that we just avoided. We stayed away from. I remember one time my cousin, who was uh, 
about the same age, maybe a year or two younger than I was, fell into that thing with all those dead snakes. And how panicky we were. Of course they were dead, but they were snakes. So cisterns don't have a lot of appeal uh, in, in my history. Cisterns don't attract visitors, but springs do. Living water does. Cistern lives don't attract seekers to find the Spirit of God and Christ in our lives. If you're living out of the cistern of the world around you, you're not going to win people to Jesus Christ. We need that living water. God says to the Israelites, and I think we need a Jeremiah today to talk to us. Tell us we've hewn for ourselves cisterns. Cisterns of finance. Cisterns of ego, fame. Cisterns of perversion. We need folks the living water. Trying to run our lives our own way substituting programs and rituals and deeds for the living water within that becomes a resource to others. A revival we need to return to the living waters. We need to think about what is our source of water, our source of life. We can't live without water. But what are we looking for? What are we finding? The water. Remember Jesus said, if you drink the water I give you, you'll never thirst. That's where we need to find the water in our lives, the resource.